Good morning. My name is Bahar Davari from the University of San Diego, and I have the easy task of chairing this session of Interfaith Issues, the Art of Bridge Building. Since we are already beginning five minutes late, I'll just quickly introduce our first speaker. Um, since we have all four speakers here, each will speak for 15 minutes. I'll give three minute notices and then one minute notices and then finish so that we have time for question and answer. Our first speaker is Patricia Madigan, who was awarded her PhD in the Department of Arabic and Islamic Studies at the University of Sydney, where she's currently an honorary associate. She's the chair of the Broken Bay Catholic Diocesan Commission for Interfaith Relations in Sydney and director of the Simmer. Her talk will be on ethics in a multi-faith society, Christians and Muslims in dialogue. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be in such a group to sit today. In 1993, Robert Muller, a former Deputy General Secretary of the United Nations, addressed the second meeting of the Parliament of the World's Religions with the following prophetic words. Religions and spiritual traditions, the world needs you very much. You more than anyone else, have experience, wisdom, insights, and a feeling for the miracle of life of the earth and of the universe. After having been pushed aside in many fields of human endeavor, you must again be the lighthouse, the guides, the prophets, and messengers of the one and last mysteries of the universe and eternity. You must set up mechanisms to agree and you must give humanity the divine or cosmic rule for our behavior on this planet. So today I'm asking what might be the basis on which Christianity and Islam might build together some common ethical goals. Both Christianity and Islam are built on ethical foundations, each containing at its core an emphasis on ethical praxis and teaching. Points of intersection between ethical teachings of Islam and Christianity might be understood to include A, the ethical impulse, which is found in both the Gospel and in the Quran, B, the exemplars of each religion, Jesus and Muhammad, C, the development of a philosophical, theological tradition of ethical teaching in each religion, as well as D, the connections made between spirituality and ethics in each religion. It is significant that both Christianity and Islam have in the course of their long history developed complex ethical theories based on philosophical principles which connect at important points, such as their emphasis on natural law and principles which can be discerned by human reason as a framework for religiously motivated virtue. For the purpose of today's discussion, perhaps one of the most significant of developments was the emergence in the medieval world of Islamic uh, and Arabic culture, a great tradition of Aristotelian Plato Platonic political philosophy through such, leadings, uh, such leading thinkers as Al-Farabi, followed by a tradition whose brightest stars were Avicenna, Ibn Tufail, Averroes and Maimonides. I think it's important to recognize that these thinkers were in fact preceded by an earlier group of Muslim theologians in the middle of the 8th century known as the Mutazilites who had also began to make use of Greek ideas in the course of their thinking. Although their stance on human responsibility and the freedom of human will was eventually decided against by the Muslim community of that time, they did come to be judged heretical on completely other grounds, the significance of the contribution made by the short-lived Mutazilites to the intellectual life of Islam 
lies in the fact that they were the original postulators as early as the ninth century of a rational discipline of speculative or philosophical theology in Islam, which has the potential to take on a new relevance today. Taking a closer look at the theological philosophical traditions shared by Christianity and Islam, we can acknowledge their time-bound character. For example, the Augustinian approach to ethics reflects Augustine's concern to relate the Platonic ideas which were current in his time to Catholic orthodoxy and therefore to render Christianity more intellectually accessible to his contemporaries. <coughs> Thomas Aquinas, by basing his arguments on natural law and logical reasoning, achieved a similar correlation with the newly rediscovered Aristotelian ideas of his time. Aquinas' method has held a position of primacy in Catholic ethical thinking until very recently and is still an important resource in Catholic Christian tradition. When Greek philosophy, especially the works of Plato and Aristotle, were introduced to the Muslim world from the mid-century, mid-8th century onwards, they were translated into Arabic by Syriac Christians and then later reintroduced to the West in the 12th and 13th century with the assistance of Muslim and Jewish scholars. This historical meeting point between Christians and Muslims, I think, is becoming increasingly significant in relation to modern developments in ethical thought. Today, there is an urgent need for a new intellectual synthesis between a relatively static, traditionalist, historical Islam and the constantly changing situation of the modern world. In order to engage fully in rationalist debate, there is a need within this, the Islamic community to overcome the epistemological crisis in the Islamic religious sciences, which is the result of a self-cultivated dislocation between theology, ethics, and law in Islamic tradition, to enable it to investigate and expound afresh the doctrinal and ethical prepositions of early judicial tradition. Similarly, any modern reappropriation of natural law ethics in Christianity will also need to critique its time-bound elements. In particular, ways in which prevailing cultural assumptions help to shape the thought of men such as Augustine and Aquinas. They're thinking about the doctrine of original sin, the problem of evil in the world and the role and nature of women has had a profoundly negative effect on the church's theology and teaching in relation to women. It has locked women into relationships of hierarchical subordination and excluded them from leadership roles in the church on biological grounds. In modern debates on social and political ethics, Muslims and Christians have the potential to collaborate on ethical questions through a process by which good and evil can be known through human reason within a revised theory of natural law, freed from its medieval cultural presumptions. From a Catholic point of view, it is significant that Benedict XVI has proposed natural law and reason as common, as common elements in dialogues, both with secular society and with other communities of faith in a secular context. In harmony with many modern Muslim reformers, he has suggested that the solution is a necessary relatedness between faith and reason and between reason and religion, which are called to purify and help one another and has expressed the hope that ultimately the essential values and norms that are in some way known or sensed by all people will take on a new brightness. We now consider the possibilities for Muslim Christian collaboration in common ethical goals and ways that they can learn from and inspire each other. Both Christian and Islamic religious traditions enshrine a host of significant ethical concerns. Each tradition has addressed in various degrees matters of race, ethnicity and gen gender, the environment and stewardship of creation, social justice, economic equity, slavery and human rights, war and peace. One important and urgent area that would benefit greatly from a renewed ethical reflection by Muslims and Catholic Christians is that of gender and women's human rights discourse. For this to occur, it will be necessary for both traditions to critique their historical use of Aristotelian and in the case of Catholic Christians, Thomistic concepts, which lock women into old biologistic, procreative and hierarchical model of sexu sexuality and to embrace other more culturally appropriate Aristotelian paradigms such as that of human flourishing. 
The situation at the beginning of the third millennium is that much of the prosperity of the developed world is built upon the disadvantage of women, especially women in developing countries. In the era of globalised economics, where a race to the bottom is critical for super profits in assembly plants, export processing zones and garment sweatshops, it is women's labour that allows and guarantees maximum prof profitability for the corporate elite, a tiny minority of the world's inhabitants. UN studies and World Bank statistics show that at the turn of the 21st century, women bear a disproportionate burden of the world's poverty. World religions are among the most powerful ideological, socio-political and spiritual forces. And they play a crucial role in the interpretation, organisation and reinforcement of particular gender relationships. Religion is only one determinant of women's status and role in society. Political and socio-cultural conditions are equally, if not more, important. Nevertheless, the influence of religion is a powerful factor in mediating women's status. While the strength of the natural law approach to ethics lies in its ability to appeal to common human values known experientially, its inherent limitation is that these experiences will always be interpreted and values generalised from particular historical and cultural standpoints. The rationalisation given by Aristotle that the patriarchal relationships of the household and state are based not on economic function and social convention, but on nature, continues the same contradiction that existed in Aristotelian philosophy between egalitarian ideals and patriarchal political and legal structures. And it continues to be defended in, the, in both the Islamic world and in the Catholic Church today. A common ethical goal which Muslim and Catholic religious leaders need to set themselves is to examine these medieval teachings and practices in regard to women which continue to underpin and maintain their patriarchal and in the case of Catholicism, hierarchical structures. This is not an unattainable or impractical goal since Aristotelian and Thomistic scholars generally agree that the principles for the necessary revision are all available in Aquinas' account of human freedom and equality notwithstanding its historical conditioning. A possible resource for beginning the transformation of gender relationships, gender relations, which would be compatible with a Muslim and Catholic rationalist approach to ethics, has been suggested by the work of Marcus Lee and uh, the winner of the 1998 Nobel Prize in Economics and philosopher Martha Nussbaum, whose joint work on the underlying dynamics of poverty, gender inequality and human development has led to breakthroughs in un United Nations policy and practice. The capabilities approach developed by Sen and Nussbaum is significant since unlike the medieval <coughs> philosophical construction of a human nature in which women are dependent on men for the realisation of their full humanity, the idea of capabilities is directed towards the perfection of each human life in a relation of human flourishing, a concept which has equally strong Aristotelian and Thomistic foundations. Rejecting any charge that such an approach is Western or culturally inappropriate, Nussbaum views the capabilities approach as fully universal since the capabilities in question are important for each and every citizen in each and every nation. So in conclusion, I believe that despite different significant differences in the way that Muslim and Christians understand their respective scriptures, despite their divergent histories and cultural differences, a considerable amount of common ground exists on which to move towards ethical cooperation. One area urgently in need of reappraisal in both, both traditions is the philosophical theological basis of each religion's ethical teachings on women and gender relations. If Muslims and Catholics are to make a meaningful contribution to ethical debate in the contemporary global community, Muslims need to reconnect the early ethical impulse of the Quran from its entrapment in legal rulings frozen in time and to rediscover their rationalist ethical tradition, which, although it has been marginalised in the course of history, nevertheless is firmly rooted in the Quran and is an integral part of Islamic theological tradition. Both Muslims and Catholic Christians need to rescue their understanding of natural law from its 12th century cultural conditioning and align it with modern developments in human psychology, sociology and anthropology. Concepts such as unchanging human nature need to be superseded by human flourishing as an ethical ideal. Although there will almost certainly still remain differences of opinion about particular ethical issues in our very complex modern societies, 
these differences may not be between Muslims and Christians so much as differences within each religious community regarding, for example, the interpretation of scripture between philosophical thought streams, different scientific and other world views and human experience. Thank you, Dr. Madigan. Our next speaker is Bishop Dulip Chikera, who is the former Anglican Bishop of Colombo, Sri Lanka, where he's the founder member of the Congress of Religions and a member of the Friday Forum Civil Society Advocacy Group. His talk is entitled, Peace Building and Reconciliation Among the People of Sri Lanka. I like to add a rider to this topic by saying lessons being learned in the process of building peace and reconciliation. Some of you are probably aware that Sri Lanka is an exceptionally good model of an interreligious society in the sense that our society is made up of different world religions plus two or three other smaller religions. In addition, we are a people of several ethnic groups of which the majority ethnic group are the Sinhala people and the next largest group, which is the largest minority group, are the Tamil people. There was a time when Sri Lanka was referred to as the pearl of the Indian Ocean. Today, no longer do people see us like that. In fact, the journalists of the world today refer to us as the teardrop of the Indian Ocean. Now what, what really went wrong? What is the crisis? In a sentence, the Sri Lankan crisis is the tragic and the unfortunate deterioration of an ethnic conflict which has today manifested itself in the form of a crisis of authoritarian governance in which the Tamil problem remains a central factor. So for several years, it was an ethnic problem. And then the dynamics of this problem has changed in such a way that today the primary challenge is good governance, law and order, human rights, and so on. But within this, the problem of the Tamils remain central. I would like to identify three root causes for this. The first is the inability of the Sri Lankan people to appreciate and appropriate the gifts of diversity for our common good. God is the creator of diversity and pluralism. The second, our inability to address our differences and disagreements in a civilized way. Jesus said, if there are differences, sit and talk. And thirdly, the failure of the Sri Lankan people to prevent these inabilities from becoming entrenched in our social consciousness, in our understanding and interpretation of our history, and also in the democratic institutions, ideals, and democratic process of today. Now, consequently, we continue to experience political confrontation and turbulence. Every political issue is an issue for confrontation, a clash. Social distrust and polarization continues. 
violence and violations, both visible and structural, with immense suffering involving death and killings and a destruction of the economy is another very serious consequence. And then over the last few years, since the war came to an end in May 2009, an unprecedented global interest, which is now becoming a global scrutiny and bordering on diplomatic intervention in the affairs of Sri Lanka. Some of you may be aware that in March this year, the UN Human Rights Council adopted a resolution on Sri Lanka, asking the government to implement the recommendations of a presidential commission, and also suggesting that Sri Lanka goes a little beyond that and addresses violations in international law. Now, what is the way forward? I'm aware that we are at an interfaith seminar, so I shall be concentrating on what the various religions in Sri Lanka ought to be attempting to do together. But before that, I need to flag the task ahead in a nutshell, because it's not possible to talk about interfaith engagement until you see the big picture. So what are the major issues that need to be addressed? And I'll give this to you uh, in a word. There must be economic justice. And very often that has been the cause of conflict and confrontation amongst the people. We need to deal with the past. Deal with the past in such a way that you remember the terrible things that we have done to each other so that we may never repeat them. There must be a restoration of democratic foundations. Our parliament must become democratic. Our cabinet must become democratic. Our constitution must be democratic. The media must be permitted to function with responsibility, but also with independence. There must also be a dismantling of the instruments and symbols of force, militarization, as a problem-solving method. The war is over, but there is a threatening presence of the military in all parts of the country. And not only so, but as and when social issues and problems are raised, the military is often used to restrict those movements. Even, for instance, if it is some unrest among students in a university. We must have a devolution of political power. And this is why the present system of government that we have, the unitary system, is very unsatisfactory. Because even if there are constitutional changes in a unitary system of government, what the center gives today, the center can withdraw tomorrow. And so what we need is perhaps a federal system in which once power is devolved, it can only be withdrawn when the center and the periphery agree to do so. There must also be a strengthening of civil society. Much of the voices and the forces and the advocacy has been reduced and suppressed. Civil society must be permitted to play its role in a modern democratic state. And finally, there must be a quest for global justice. You see, you can't look at the Sri Lankan problem apart from geopolitics. You can't look at the Sri Lankan problem apart from global injustice. And let me just give you one example. Some of you may be aware of the atrocity crimes that are identified under responsibility to protect, which is a recent UN doctrine. 
war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and so on. Now, there are some of us who feel that the manufacture and transaction in arms of destruction must also be made an atrocity crime. Now, these are some of the areas of global justice that the Sri Lankan polity is concerned about. Now, having flagged those areas, I would like to spend the rest of this presentation talking about the rationale and the agenda for interfaith engagement. We have in Sri Lanka, like you have in India and in other parts of the world, a dialogue which is referred to as living dialogue. In other words, we don't need to attend conferences and consultations to meet people of other faiths. We meet people of other faiths in the classroom, in the marketplace, in the living room. Now it was from this living dialogue, people of different faiths sharing a common life together, that our theologians rediscovered a biblical theology for interfaith cooperation. And this biblical theology is based on three very clear attributes of God. Firstly, God is omnipresent. Present always. That's what God is. Secondly, God is eternal. No beginning, no end, or if you like in human terms, from the beginning to the end. And thirdly, where God is everywhere present all the time, God is dynamic. God is the same life-giving power. Now, based on this biblical theology, our theologians and Indian theologians, South Asian theologians, have suggested that God has consequently been present and influencing all histories, all cultures, all people. So that when you dialogue with people of other faiths, you're really listening not to another God, but to the same God who comes to us in a different idiom. Now, I would like to say more on this, but I'm conscious of time. It was from there that we moved into a question that is now beginning to redefine our understanding of mission. And this is that if God is present in all communities and all religions, and if the church in Sri Lanka is humble enough to acknowledge that in spite of all our good work, Sri Lanka is not going to become Christian, they're just 7%, then how does that redefine mission? God's mission will and must continue. Quickly running through five points in the agenda. Peace and reconciliation that is sustainable will come to Sri Lanka when politicians come to their senses. So it's a political solution that we are looking for. Religions will never be able to do what politicians are expected to do, but religions can influence the process of politics and politicians. And one of the problems that we have noted is a tension in the interaction between religion and politics, which calls for a balance between accessibility to political leaders and what is known as the prophetic responsibility. So in a conversation with political leaders, if you talk too much about the need for justice, the rapport suffers. But if you develop the rapport too much, then the call for a prophetic witness and justice begins to suffer. So here is a delicate balance that we need to sustain. 
Secondly, there is a sensitive suspicion that religions have got to cast with regard to people of power, both in the country and in the world. We are afraid that one day soon, because Sri Lanka has discovered oil off its northeastern coast, that there will be a deal between the people of power in the globe and in Sri Lanka. And then the vulnerable will be neglected. So our stance is the religions must stand for the poor, the weak, and victims and represent those voices consistently. We're also looking at a concept of healing justice, which is different to retributive justice, because that gives hardly any chance to the perpetrator, but also that questions what is known as restorative justice, because that's a little thin and weak on the position of victims. Healing justice will be victim-centered but violator inclusive. How would you develop that? This sounds nice, but there will be resistance. This sounds nice, and change will take a long time. What is the Christian, what is the religious response to this? And the only thing we can offer is that people of religion and disciples of Christ are called to strive. That is the primary and the lasting characteristic of a disciple of Jesus. We don't give up. You strive. You have a vision and you work towards this. The Christian understanding of history is linear. The Buddhist understanding of history is cyclic. But we are now in a conversation as to how these two can meet. The Buddhists want to see something linear. The Christians discover that a lot of history keeps repeating. So we are now talking of a cyclo-linear understanding of history. You move round and round. Much of it is repeated, but you're moving towards that eschatological hope. Finally, and then I finish, how do you deal with the enemy? In the words of Archbishop Rowan Williams, stay with the enemy till there is a blessing for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop Chikere. Our next speaker is Dr. Susie Babka, Assistant Professor in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of San Diego. She received her PhD in Systematic Theology from the University of Notre Dame and will be speaking to us today on emptiness and otherness, negative theology and the language of compassion. Thank you. I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. I am never without it. Anywhere I go, you go, my dear. And whatever is done by only me is your doing, my darling. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root and the bud of the bud and the sky of the sky of a tree called life which grows higher than soul can hope or mind can hide. And this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. E. E. Cummings' poem is both about emptiness, the wonder that's keeping the stars apart, and compassion. Anywhere I go, you go, and whatever is done by only me is your doing such that the space between the stars puts the stars in relation to each other. They can never be what they are in isolation. This is the deepest secret nobody knows, the root of the root and the bud of the bud, that no thing finds existence in itself in isolation or independently, but in what is other than itself. Life must be lived ecstatically from ecstasis to stand outside the confines of the self. Beyond the in itself and for itself, there is human nakedness, writes Emmanuel Levinas. Nakedness of the other that cries out to me its strangeness to the world, the word of God in the human face. The first violence within mercy, he writes, is in giving up the self to prepare a space for the other. 
We can explore affinities between kenosis, meaning self-emptying, in the Christian and Jewish traditions, and shunyata, which in Mahayana Buddhism refers to emptiness, without ex assuming or expecting strict agreement to engage in what Masao Abe called a mutual transformation of traditions within a community of discourse. Masao Abe was trained in the Kyoto School of Japanese philosophy, which worked to make Buddhism intelligible to the West. He believed that dialogue with Christianity not only prompts self-critique, but also a shared interest to respond to growing secularity in both Eastern and Western societies. The goal is not a unified religion, but a depth of spirituality from which religious traditions can emerge as mutually supportive, responding together to crises of justice. Apophatic theology, or theology of negation, is an important entry point to considering what is mutually transformative about the principles of kenosis, shunyata, and otherness. Negation has affinities in nearly every religious tradition. However, to examine whether meaning is possible in a world in which a young girl in Haiti dies of cholera and I have done nothing to alleviate her suffering, I also want to discuss whether compassion is possible and whether we can discuss God in the context of compassion. Discourse about God is rendered mute by catastrophic suffering. The wars, genocide, famine, AIDS epidemic, and cholera in Haiti make it impossible to discuss God as though there were a purpose or a plan for this. Discourse about God from the trenches of the world's poverty and pain cannot be conducted with the same rules with which we determine train schedules and mortgage payments. Toward this end, the way of negation moves toward emptiness, shunyata in the Mahayana Buddhism of Masao Abe, and kenosis is explained by Emmanuel Levinas. Discourse about God must have different presuppositions and play different games, as Ludwig Wittgenstein cautions. But Wittgenstein also said, about that which we can say nothing, let us be silent. And here I am gabbing on and on about it, and will continue to gab for the next 10 minutes or so. Catastrophic suffering renders theology mute because it raises the possibility of a world without meaning. For those of us who desire meaning in a senseless world, the excess of suffering changes the landscape of the theological game, but it doesn't prevent us from playing. In this respect, discourse about God benefits from a willingness to enter into dialogue with religious traditions that are not my own, so that I can at least negotiate the boundaries of the games within my own religion, lest I become guilty of confining God to one paradigm. The Christian paradigm with which I am most familiar often responds to catastrophic suffering as an opportunity for redemption, such that the cross of Christ or the tears of a child suffering from cholera shows us humanity blossoming, blossoming in extreme conditions, which Theodore Adorno calls a dreary metaphysics that affirms the horror by virtue of the notion that the authenticity of the human being is manifested there. It is a dreary metaphysics indeed when Christians move the cross from a place of abject horror to a place of triumph, or worse, necessity. Such does not critique the conditions in which a child dies every three seconds of malnutrition, violence, and preventable disease. If God is merely sympathetic to this suffering but does not somehow contradict what Adorno called the officially optimistic society that led to it, if God is the idol of humankind's history of success, then catastrophic suffering will continue to be defensible as an unfortunate side effect of the progression of the divine plan. Dissatisfaction with such dreary metaphysics as these calls Christians to destroy the idols of this language, as Buddhism wishes to destroy the idol of the self, the first step of which is negation. Speaking about God in the face of catastrophic suffering requires that Christians negate in shunyata the concept within a substance ontology of a creator separate from the world, who creates the world as an afterthought and so is ontologically distant from the world. Most substance-oriented discourse about God places God squarely within the horizon of, of objecti objectification. God has existence. God caused the hurricane. God is loving or powerful or sees everything that we do. 
reason and logic better suited for the observable world of cause and effect are not the way to a divine reality understood as beyond both existence and non-existence as apprehended by the senses in a material world. Hence, we cannot think about God in ways that we think about what we had for lunch. God is not an object among other objects or entities in our daily lives. The question here is whether Christians are prepared to negate a substance ontology in order to open itself to the sort of transformation that will make it more effective in responding to the crises of injustice in the world. Shunyata eclipses a substance ontology by accessing things in their suchness, their alterity, when we make an effort to stand in the same mode of being as the other. This is the non-distinct realization of emptiness and non-emptiness, a dynamic emptiness of all finite meaning. Shunyata is not nihil, a dead nothing opposed to being. It is not a position which denies but the negation of any position at all, no center, no authority, but rather dependent co-origination. Abe notes that in a coming both affirmation and negation, a complete emptiness is opened up. This is a positionless position, a standpoint free from any standpoint, free from all human presuppositions and conceptualizations. Even the linguistic designation shunyata must not be absolute. Abe writes, quote, shunyata is fundamentally shunyata under erasure. True shunyata empties itself as well as everything else. Through its self-emptying, it makes everything exist and work as it does. As dependent co-origination, Shunyata articulates that all entities or things lack independent existence at the deepest level. The beingness of any thing is so only within the total network of whatever had a possible relationship to it. There is no apple without the rain, the sun, the sun and the earth which helped it grow, the harvesters who gathered it, the truckers who brought it to the market, and those who recognize from the aphids to me that it is good to eat. The existence of things and events is entirely contingent and interdependent, but empty of any center of authority. Another example of this is the interdependency of human beings imprinted on us at the biological and genetic level. Anyone who lived 1,600 years ago, who had children, and whose children had children, is likely to be your ancestor. Because of human migrations and mating, the DNA in our cells consists of bits of DNA from thousands of people's cells a millennium ago. Even if a disaster wiped out the entire human race except in Asia, the human race would still retain 94% of its genetic variation. Human beings are related to each other in ways our conscious awareness rarely addresses. Despite the subsequent cultural conflicts based on our visible differences, our bodies possess the wisdom of interrelatedness not sameness, in the depths of our DNA. As genetically in relationship, the entire human race is empty of a center of authority. This is echoed in the Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna's teaching that on the conventional or physical level, the world is not illusory. It is real in that we experience it. Acorns become oak trees. The sun rises in the east. Gravity pulls things to earth. But from the perspective of what is ultimate, Nagarjuna has said that things and events do not possess existence for themselves. The world of things and events is real in terms of dependent co-origination and interconnectedness within the womb of dynamic emptiness. Thinking otherwise than being, or beyond a substance ontology, to Levinas means the other opens a, a space of transcendence, or desire, ecstasis the desire to empty the self on behalf of the other. Transcendence is a positive infinity which is realized in emptiness, the infinite kenosis of the self and the desire for the other. Derrida observes that the space opened by Levinas's understanding of encounter with the other, what E.E. E. Cummings might name as the wonder that's keeping the stars apart, or what the Kabbalists thought of as symptom, is a positive infinity. The ego or self is moved toward infinite responsibility in the face of the other. Levinas traces the Jewish understanding of kenosis by describing the God who bends to inhabit human misery. In Psalm 147, God who heals the brokenhearted and binds their wounds also counts the number of the stars and gives them all their names. Writes Levinas, there is an inseparable bond between God's descent and God's elevation. 
Wherever we find the power of the Holy One, we find God's humility, the proximity of God to human suffering. The space that God opens for us while honoring our alterity as creatures also subordinates God's infinite being to the human. In the emptiness of divine openness to the other, located within the order of action and work at the level of matter, everything depends on the human, even the outpouring of God. God's self-emptying makes the space for human being to ensure the holiness in the other than myself, such that we are answerable for the holiness of the universe. This responsibility is found in the microcosm of human relationship, as well as in the macrocosm of the interaction of humanity with the plurality of worlds. The meaning of being is responsibility for the other, which is an infinite responsibility originating from God's kenosis. In conclusion, alterity engenders compassion. The enlightened one returns to the world of samsara because to be enlightened is to be compassionate. Do not abide in nirvana, writes Levinas, quote, being is through ethics and the human. Humanity is responsible for the universe. Humanity makes and unmakes worlds, elevates and lowers them. God's reign depends on me. God has subordinated, subordinated God's efficacy, God's association with the real and the very presence of the real to my merit or demerit. God's reign, God reigns only by the intermediary of an ethical order, an order in which one being is answerable for another. The world is, not because it perseveres in being, not because being is its own raison d'etre, but because through human enterprise it can be justified in its being. The human is the possibility of a being for the other. That possibility is the justification of all existing. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Our next speaker is Father Kandothra George. He's a professor of systematic and patristic theology at the Orthodox Theological Seminary in Kerala, India. Father George has studied theology in India, Louvain, and Paris, and he'll be talking to us on inventing a new time and space for our common dwelling. Dear friends, Accepting the imprisonment of 15 minutes, I will make seven brief points. And what I'm going to say uh, will have implications for interfaith relations, not directly, but indirectly. Um, I'm going to speak about space and time. Um, my first point is about ecumenism. The old word ecumene, or the whole inhabited world, as it is translated, has crucial implications for our general theme of common dwelling. The idea of ecumene was an ancient attempt to conceive of a single human community living together in one single world. The idea, however, had political and cultural assumptions that went against the grain of the very notion of one humanity and one world. Uh, politically, Vecumene was a synonym of the old Roman Empire. Culturally, it excluded all those peoples of the world who lived outside the frontiers of the Roman Empire and did not recognize them as civilized human beings. Because these peoples did not share in the uh, Greco-Roman uh, culture. So looking at it from the perspective uh, today, uh, there was no common dwelling nor any one world or one humanity coming out of the concept of ecumeny. Secondly, the political cultural demon of the old Roman ecumeny continue to haunt the modern world through colonial missionary movement, through the notion of unending progress as seen in science and technology, and through neo-colonial economic structures attempting to globalize 
a world of immense natural diversity. The Christian churches in the West made a great effort in the 20th century to exorcise the old ecumeny of its imperialistic and exclusivistic demon and to interpret it in more charitable and humane ways through the modern ecumenical movement. However, as we watch the contemporary world scenario, we come to understand that the whole inhabited world as projected in the old ecumeny has become fragmented and unwholesome and is becoming rapidly uninhabited. The whole is now unwholesome uh, and the inhabited is now no longer inhabitable. Because of global warming, climate change, and the other disastrous consequences of the ecological crisis. Hence the urgent need for reconceiving the old ecumeny. Thirdly, <coughs> for the last 500 years or so, time and space, the fundamental categories of our existence, have been defined in terms of West European civilization and its truly brilliant accomplishments like modern science and technology. The large majority of the peoples of the world have been forced to follow these definitions for obvious reasons. Space was simply the geopolitical extension uh, of the colonial powers. They discovered space outside of Europe, beginning with the adventurous explorations of Columbus towards the west by mistake and Vasco da Gama towards the east. Within uh, an interval of six years in the, at the end of the 15th century, and Vasco da Gama landed in my country of Kerala, state of Kerala in South India. If you look at the medieval maps, which are still on the walls of the Vatican Palace, you see a small landmass of Europe surrounded by a vast empty space, all with the title uh, Terra Incognita, uh, unknown land, unknown earth. Eventually, uh, these unknown lands were all discovered and named in a rhyming Latin style, Africa, Asia, America, Australia, Arctica, Antarctica, and so on. I am proudly uh, aware of my being an Asian, but with the heavy memory of being an originally unknown entity discovered and named by Europe. My identity and the identity of my dwelling place ha had been defined for me centuries ago by an alien uh, cultural mindset. Fourthly, Time suffered the same fate. All the local calendars created and followed by peoples of the world for ages have been suppressed in favor of an old Roman imperial calendar started by Julius Caesar and later reformed by Pope Gregory in the 16th century. You know, calendars are cultural creations reflecting the cosmic and historical worldview of each culture. Suppression of these cal calendars meant the brutal suppression of their uh, cultural psychological identity. I measure my time on the basis of GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. But what has Greenwich to do with my own innate sense of time and my cultural understanding of time? What has Gregorian calendar to do with the rhythm of nature or the sense of history in my own dwelling place. A Judeo-Christian linear understanding of time and history produced a concept like unending, unending progress that dominates our political and economic world designs. It is significant that the standards of physical measurements of length weight, volume, and time are all kept in London, in Paris, and in other centers of Western Europe. And we have no 
heard on these things. The fifth point, the contemporary pluralistic world where we have a multitude of competing rival religions, cultural and political perceptions of reality demands a radical reconceiving of the old concepts a liberation of time and space from its political and cultural iron box is essential for a new configuration of ecclesia, of church, and of the world where we can dwell in common. Sixth point, the biblical notion of the body of Christ is not simply a literary metaphor, but a crucial concept for revisiting the original Christian ecclesiology genetics and physics and other sciences are telling us that it's no longer a, a, a convenient metaphor for theologians, but it is something very, very literal, the one bodiness, one bodiliness of the whole world, including human beings. Now this can go along with a shift in natural and human sciences from a mechanistic paradigm to an organic, life-centered and holistic perception of reality. The body of Christ is precisely embodying this holistic and life-affirming quality essential for a true Christian understanding. Unity, holiness, Catholicity, the apostolicity of the church need to be reappropriated in terms of a new vision of the world within a new frame of space and time, the new wineskin, I would say. And finally, the seventh point, the new ecological wisdom that humanity has recently gained, it's clear that our world will not be sustainable or inhabitable if we continue the current order of a consumerist carbon civilization and our present temporal order of progress. We need to search for an ecclesiology of the common good and sharing of resources uh, as well as a life of simplicity, a hospitality, respect for all life, and commitment to the other, as exemplified by saints like Francis of Assisi and Mahatma Gandhi um, in, the, in our time. The ancient Eastern perception, Hindu, Buddhist, Taoist, the Eastern perception that space and time are creations of human consciousness together with the Christian commitment to the transfiguration of the world, can create a new order of space and time where we can dwell together in justice and peace. Thank you. Thank you, Father George and everyone on the panel. We have about 30 minutes for question and answer and a microphone here that I hope it works. So if you have question, raise your hand. I'll run to you with the microphone so everybody can hear the question. Yeah, can you hear me? No, okay, questions? I feel like the showman, showwoman, Oprah. Hi, uh, my name's Adrian, I'm from Sydney, Australia. Uh, my question's directed to Susie. Well, it's not so much of a question, it's a request for maybe some expansion and clarification. Um, you mentioned the cross, and I suppose the, that concept of, you know, redemptive suffering, uh, you know, critique that concept of redemptive suffering. I was wondering um, maybe uh, if you could expand a little bit on um, what apophatic theology has to say about the cross, or, and maybe what the cross has to say about apophatic theology. Is that a fair question? Um, and the point I was trying to make is that the, the, the cross is much too often in Christian history t been taken as something that was preordained or predestined by God as though this is something that was necessary for human redemption. And so Christians have typically taken that and said, well, catastrophic suffering while bad and terrible and everything is still something that we have to go through in order to make it to, you know, the end or the telos or whatever. And, and I think what apophatic theology tries to do is say that, is, is critique that, for one thing, and that whole 
perspective and say that maybe the cross was never necessary. Maybe the cross is not the will of God and is not part of, you know, any plan. And there maybe there is no plan. Maybe we can just get rid of all of that. Maybe nothing was served by the murder of Christ. Maybe nothing at all. And so trying to, you know, remember that even things that we hold dear as Christians need to be critiqued, else we don't have the same motivation to really address catastrophic suffering in society. I think that all too often Christians become complacent to the level of catastrophic suffering in society. Did I, did I just, oh, does that help? Uh, Christine McCarthy, Fordham University. Uh, I want to thank all of the presenters for your papers. I enjoyed all of them. Um, I wanted to, this isn't really a question as much as it is um, a comment um, to, uh, to Dr. Madigan. And I, I, I walked in halfway through your paper, so I missed the beginning. And so um, I'm not sure how much this is part of your, a larger project that you have, but I, I feel a great sympathy for the work that you do and have done work previously on, um, on uh, crime and mental illness capabilities um, in terms of whether how they whether and how they can be applied um, to to religious um, groups and groups of faith, and I guess my suggestion in my research that I uh, found is that what um, given Nussbaum's uh, political liberal framework, um, there's not much. She protects the right to um, to have a religious practice, but um, I think at least in terms of the research dialogues, I. Um, we can sort of understand capabilities, um, not just in terms of an active uh, capability to do something, but, and I think, and this is in the way that dovetails a bit nicely with Dr. Dodds' presentation, um, that we can understand um, a possibility for like a pop-up day and openness or receptivity that one does not have to necessarily participate in if we can sort of take away from that um, faith or religious um, framework, but that there is, um, you could also call it a pop-up day, but sort of like a, a, I don't know, a tap back to an openness in some way um, that those are, that are, it's my only, um, it's something that just came to mind to me. I don't know how, how that came to mind for you in your work, but I think at least in terms of, especially uh, Christian Muslim uh, dialogues, and Islam is a religion which, um, you know, some people, the negative, yeah, ability to remain that as well is sort of uh, important. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, I feel like I'm just like, um, well, um, were, you, were you able to hear me, Dr. Madigan, or? Just wondering, wh what exactly is the question? It wasn't a question. I was could. <laughs> well, it wasn't a question in the first place. It was just a suggestion for further um, research, which is to say that um, in addition to sort of adopting uh, Nussbaum's capabilities framework, which is essentially um, not one that takes into, that um, it protects religious belonging and religious practice, but what I was suggesting in terms of further interfaith dialogue is to understand not only uh, capability in terms of an active doing, but to maybe also create a space for understanding capability as a capacity towards openness, and I saw this as a way of dovetailing with Dr. Dodds' presentation on compassion to the other and openness to the other. Does this make sense? Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Uh, I think what most of what you said I, I agree with. Um, I, I think she offers, a, what I see her offering is a framework that actually there's a lot of space for self-determination within that framework. So you, you, know, so you say she works in a liberal framework. Um, in some ways she does, but she also allows people uh, people who want to live in a conser more conservative, traditional framework ha have that freedom within. That's how I understand what her what she's saying. That people who want to live in a um, more traditional, perhaps um, 
uh, and religious and conservative lifestyle, they should have that same freedom, but not to stop other women who don't want to live in that particular environment or space, to not to stop them from moving. That's how I see it. So that um, I think she off what I see her offering is a framework in which people can find, women and people generally can find their own identities within that framework. A bit of an Josh uh, University, thanks to Father Josh, I explained it somewhat very clear. Uh, uh, I'd just like to pick up one item that you mentioned the calendar. How the Western calendar determines Jesus and then Gregory. But we do have many different calendars. With the Jewish traditions, from the very beginning of creation of the world, you have the Muslim calendar with the Hajira, we have the Buddhist calendar. And there's also the Chinese calendar. All different people sign the dates of the year very differently, and not simply with the Western. But your point is well taken. But what I like to do is this, that even within the Christian calendar, between the Orthodox and Roman Catholic, there are huge debates and fighting about the date of Easter, for instance. So you have all kind of calendar going on at the same time. Uh, my question to you is, living in these multiple calendars, how do you suggest people interacting in interreligious way of life from the Jewish, the Islam, the Muslim, the Christian, and even between the Orthodox and the Catholic? Yes, uh, thank you um, for that. Yes, we still live with uh, different calendars. I have my friend, Dr. Cherenipen, coming from Moscow. He's an Indian Christian. So he has celebrated two Easter's this year, <laughs> one, one after the other. So, but it's okay, we live with that. But why can't we Christians come to an agreement on one Easter date? There is no great theology involved in that. It's simply a question of uh, mutual understanding and agreement, but we are not, the World Council of Church, as I know, uh, has made tremendous efforts to bring all Christians uh, to one, one, one Easter, but it has not been successful. Um, in India, um, I know, the, the, the millennium, turn of the millennium, uh, it was certainly an affirmation of the Gregorian calendar as well. Uh, and then in my country, uh, several new Calend old calendars were revived, revived by radical uh, Hindus, uh, communalist Hindus, uh, because they thought this suppression of their calendars was a sort of suppression of their own identity and culture. So there is a point in that, uh, well, for practical reasons, we have to agree on certain common dates, but uh, without cultural assumptions, uh, without being uh, uh, loading it with uh, some of the superiority assumptions, Probably that would be possible. Uh, Peter Adland, Matter Day Institute in Dublin. Uh, Susie, I'm just curious about how you would define or assess the Odyssey, just in light of what you said. And you know, Levinas was brought up, and whether you'd agree with perhaps that his more or less anti theotic stance. Yeah, I, I, I'd say so. <laughs> I don't think the Odyssey serves um, much of a purpose because the Odyssey serves to justify the existence of suffering in the world on some level. And I, I mean, while some suffering may be educative and, and valuable in that sense, I think that what, what I tried to express, obviously we're dealing with a short amount of time, is not so much ed educative suffering, which always has an inbuilt purpose to it, but catastrophic suffering that is, um, it, it is truly hard to see um, in the excess of suffering in the world, whether it's, you know, um, Haiti with its multi-layered series of problems from natural disasters to colonialism, you know, decades of that, dealing with the after effects of that to now cholera. To me, I don't see an inbuilt purpose to any of that. I think that, um, and, and as soon as we start to apply theodicy to, to extreme suffering or catastrophic suffering, and again, the distinction is, you know, not clear always. Um, we t it tends to, you know, reduce our motivation to overcome suffering. And I think that that's my primary 
form of critique, that as soon as, and this goes back to the other question about the cross, as soon as the cross becomes justified as somehow necessary, then, well, you know, maybe we are all just supposed to bear a cross and that the young girl dying of cholera in Haiti is supposed to bear her cross. Now, I'm not, you know, going to say that, you know, the, the cross isn't important. It's certainly important, but it's not justified. I mean, I would have loved to have had Christ with us for another 50 years, and so he could have told us more because we've been trying to figure out so much. Um, certainly, the cross also leads the way to the resurrection. Um, and so in that sense, that's important. And I, I, it's not as though I don't applaud Christ's sacrifice. It's the sense that it was necessary, which justifies it, that uh, I think removes the odyssey from the picture. Uh, Nick Mumjian, Hartford Seminary, and kind of following on those two questions, Susie, and you already alluded to the idea of resurrection. So what would negative theolog theology say or critique on the necessity of resurrection? It's not the necessity of the cross, but the necessity of resurrection that, uh, that should be there. And, and so for in dealing with theodicy, um, it's not so much let's answer theodicy with the cross, but let's answer it in light or in the shadow or the lens of resurrection. And I'm thinking of like uh, maybe Howard Watts' Naming of Silence or another one, um, I can't think of the author's name, but uh, Raising with Compassion another book that tried to answer um, you know, suffering, not as saying it's, it's necessary, but how can we view that in light of resurrection? Um, the resurrection I would view as God's answer to catastrophic suffering. That um, whatever resurrection is, however we talk about it, the only way to, you know, the only direction to, you know, kind of go in order to avoid justifying suffering is to say that God answers, you know, this with, you know, with the promise of life or the promise that um, our efforts to end suffering are, you know, not in vain. I mean, if, if the resurrection did anything, the experience of resurrection did anything, it gave the early Christians hope that their efforts would not be in vain and that um, they could continue to work for the reign of God and, and not fear that somehow it would all end in, you know, in void of <laughs> the help. I am uh, George Orville from Duquesne in Pittsburgh, and this is for the bishop. I'm uh, Bishop, I wonder if uh, you would be willing to go a little further I'd like to know what you think about something, because in, if I understood you correctly, in your paper you said that in the living and being together, uh, the different religious uh, perspectives learn from each other. Would you be willing to say that God has willed the different religions so that they could truly be sacraments to each other, and therefore, no religion can claim that it has the definitive possession of God's revelation. But only in being faithful to God do we then come to see that, yes, we're not sacraments for them, but we're their sacraments to us. And so mission doesn't have to do with going out Mission has to do with welcoming those who come in. I, I would suggest that uh, when it comes to interreligious dialogue, that we are in an interim stage of understanding God's revelation through the different religions. In other words, we are all on a pilgrimage. Not only is it necessary, I think it is an expression of integrity to say that there are some questions to which we do not have answers. Having said that, I would like to refer you to this ongoing conversation within the church 
about the uniqueness of Christ and the cosmic Christ. Uh, those are tensions through which we need to address the question that you raised. I would say that Christ gives me the best perspective for life. That the spirituality of Christ is the presence of Christ within me that pushes me in the direction of the reign of God. And that I will stay in that position unless and until I'm able to see a more profound experience of truth in another religion. So what I'm really saying is I speak from a bias and I don't apologize for it. But at the same time, living with people of other faiths has <clears throat> pushed us much, much beyond the, the historic understanding of mission which came to us from the missionaries. And uh, not only is this happening within the church in South Asia and some parts of the global south, it's also happening within other religions as well. That their perspective of other religions is also beginning to change. So that we are really wrestling with the question, what is truth in Revelation? As regards the question of mission, uh, I go along with Father Aloysius Piris, who is perhaps one of the best authorities on Buddhist Christian dialogue. And his point is that the whole purpose of interreligious dialogue is for transformation within the religions that participate in the dialogue. And I can give you an example of that. Care for the creation. Uh, what we have in the Bible and in the teaching of Jesus is this much. What we have in Buddhism <coughs> is this much. So conversations between Christians and Buddhists on ecology, for instance, pushes Christians, because they hear the Buddhist perspective, to go back and rediscover what the Bible and Christ have said and perhaps what is said inadequately. And at that point, you learn to pick up the gifts of the other religion. And there again, you do it without an apology. I can give you several other examples. There's the other one of greed, tanhava in Buddhism, which is much more profound than the Christian understanding of greed. It is the real cause of suffering and injustice and conflict in the world. And tanhava is the kind of greed that sticks and destroys. You know? So now that expands the, Buddh the Christian understanding of greed. But all this within this interim journey towards the truth through revelation. Thank you. And the last question. Uh, thanks to all the panelists, uh, a very stimulating panel. I want to just direct my uh, question to Dr. Babcock, kind of continuing his discussion here. If I understand your, um, your project here, kind of fundamentally is a concern that uh, the notion that catastrophic suffering is necessary or that the suffering of Christ is necessary will demotivate political action or action in the world, a compassionate response to suffering, which can somehow leave us uh, unmotivated. And this makes perfect sense to me. But when I actually look, look at people and their uh, understandings, I don't actually necessarily see the link. Um, and since, since you've uh, engaged us in kind of a, a Buddhist Christian conversation, I'm coming from the Jewish tradition, but one of my most profound encounters of, the, you know, of this question is, is in encountering the Buddhist tradition. I have a very dear friend of more than a decade who's a, a Tibetan Buddhist, came out of, his child really came out of Tibet, but, you know, walking all the way to India. And this is, you know, part of 
his imagination and suffers greatly and uh, also becomes someone who's incredibly uh, active in the world, served in Parliament for many years, and was one of the first people to uh, bring attention to the plight of, uh, of uh, Tibetan cultural peoples in northern India, which the larger Tibetan community had largely ignored. But um, his understanding of both his own uh, exile and the sufferings of the Tibetan people, and very uncomfortably, his understanding of the suffering of the Jewish people in the Holocaust is that clearly there was karma causing this. Something had been done in the past that led to it. It had absolutely no effect on his ability to act compassionately in the world. And I mean, this is not a uh, argument against you so much as a, as a puzzle to present. Is, it, is that really what demotivates us? Is that the right point of critique if we want to kind of unleash a little more compassion in the world. Yeah, that's a, that's really um, a terrific point. Um, I guess I was speaking from within the Christian um, conception of how it, the cross has been received. That, you know, from Christian art, which sort of has the nativity scenes with images of the future cross within the scene as though this was this baby was born to die this way um the the even even the um the way that the gospels in their later development sort of tend to exonerate the roman uh the roman uh, authorities that crucified him that there's this sense as though this was all sort of preordained and, and meant to be and and I think that in that sense, that Adorno saying that this, it, it, we, we fail to critique this officially optimistic society that leads to these problems and we sort of, you know, devalue the extent of the suffering that, that happened. But that is obviously all taken within a Western Christian understanding. And so once we do enter into, you know, the Buddhist reception of catastrophic suffering, um, then obviously that, as you've described it, can certainly critique, you know, the Christian conception. And that was part of what I was trying to do, is not certainly answer definitively, you know, what um, the Buddhist-Christian dialogue can do in terms of that question, but um, bring the two... Um, two spheres of thought together so that they can mutually critique each other. Um, one of the problems often with Masao Abe is that while he's willing to critique Christianity in many ways, he isn't, even though he talked about a mutual transformation of traditions, he doesn't always look to the critique of his own tradition that also needs to take place in the encounter. And so you know, obviously as a Christian, I have no authority to say how a Buddhist should critique their own tradition. But it, 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 if we're talking about dialogue, there has to be a mutual willingness to critique one's own stance. And so from the Christian perspective, I will, will certainly say that there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, and Buddhism helps me do that in encountering Buddhism and helps me do that. Yes, exactly. Thank you to our panelists and to every one of you. See you at lunch. <laughs>